Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're tuning in from. My name is Leslie Lamb, and I'm the host and producer of the Crypto Unstacked podcast. And I'm really excited to be back as a guest host for another episode on Real Vision. And this is part of our mini series, Discovering the Space uh, About the Metaverse and Digital Fashion. Today, I am joined by a force of nature, Charlie Cohen. Charlie, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. Charlie, you've been addressing the metaverse, as it were, since 2013, or the multiverse, however you want to call it, um, and taking physical fashion into the digital world. And you said before that one of your goals is to allow anyone to take their identity with them to any part of this so-called multiverse. So I think that's a pretty massive statement, and I'm, <laughs> sure, I'm not sure everyone can comprehend this term right away. Um, so let's start off by talking about this grand ambition of yours, right? And we'll take it back to how things got started for you in the fashion space. Sure. Um, so I guess taking the the grand ambition, um, I think that the you know the ideal situation is where we don't have this barrier between our physical identity and our virtual identity because the way that we live our lives um, there isn't really a barrier we don't think like okay i'm going to do like irl time now and oh, i'm going to do <laughs> screen time now um you don't separate it in that way i think when you're socializing with people when you're chatting with people you don't really separate it out in that way um so in terms of how you are able to represent yourself um, visually, that should be equally fluid and not something that you have to think about too much. Um, and in the same way, in the physical world where you will invest in your visual identity, um, because you know that there's a utility to that, you're like, okay, I can, I can wear this to, uh, in these situations, to these events, and so on and so forth. It's the same in the digital world that there needs to be um, a value uh, to owning digital assets. And that really comes with being able to actually use them in as many different places as possible. Uh, so that's, that's really the idea um, when I'm talking about um, people being able to represent themselves um, seamlessly wherever they're socializing and existing. Um, and going back to the beginning, um, certainly the beginning of uh, working more in the digital space, mm -hmm. um, I started the Charlie Cohen brand back in 2013. Um, so prior to that, I would uh, started my first fashion brand when I was 15 to kind of learn the ropes of uh, how to run a fashion business. Um, I went to university and got my fashion degree. And by the time I left, I was very, I guess, jaded by the traditional fashion industry, um, very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable with it from a sustainability perspective, from an inclusivity perspective. Um, and I guess taking the um, the inclusivity part of it. I really like the idea of digital world building and how I could create uh, a brand where part of it was about the clothes, but a huge part of it was about having a space that you know any of the community could engage with each other, engage with me, engage with the brand, um, and really something that was a counter to the uh, very gated exclusivity of luxury fashion. Um, so I guess quite early on, I got to start experimenting with AR and VR, um, trying to find alternatives to traditional fashion weeks, which we were doing as well, uh, but being able to create these digital events that anybody could participate in, um, and that was very sort of visually inspiring, <laughs> inspiring and exciting, um, and something that really um, people hadn't been able to have access to before unless they were within these exclusive fashion circles. Um, and from there, I started working more with the gaming industry and really seeing the opportunity around uh, digital assets as well as just digital experiences. Um, so started looking at, uh, at wearables and avatar customization. And through that, um, I discovered NFTs really as a, a way to be able to bring more utility to virtual fashion. 
Um, so we've been able to do these experimental projects where we could work with specific game spaces um, and create uh, skins, wearables for these particular spaces, but it had no utility outside of that particular space. Um, so I really like the idea of there being some kind of solution to that. Um, and through 2020, um, being in this position where we could create uh, digital events and uh, digital fashion, uh, we were in a great position to do all these big brand collaborations because we had something that they really needed at that time, having had right. to cancel all of the physical activations and a lot of the physical production that they had planned for the year. Um, so we got to really experiment and start playing around with these um, just different technologies, different ways of uh, combining uh, digital and physical fashion um, and having different digital utilities. Um, so through the last, I guess, year and a half, we've collaborated with with Reebok, with Assassin's Creed, uh, with Sanrio, with Pokemon most recently. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been really able to delve into how we can create this hybrid digital physical experience. Um, Pokemon probably being one of the best examples where we worked with um, a sort of big uh, multi-brand luxury retailer in London, Selfridges. Um, we had a physical pop-up in there, uh, which basically served as a portal through into this virtual city that we'd created um, around the Pokemon IP to celebrate uh, their 25th anniversary. Um, and through the virtual space, we sold both uh, digital fashion um, that had utility across the metaverse um, and also physical fashion as well, which had... Um, sort of augmented reality integration so mm -hmm. that you could uh, point a smartphone at a physical garment and it would unlock a, an AR filter. Incredible. Let's unpack that entire journey. So we've ended, um, you know, just talking about one of your biggest projects and we'll definitely dive deeper into that. But let's go all the way back to when you were 15 because right. not everyone has a very clear path when they set out at that young age, right? Saying, this is what I want to be doing and actually doing something about it, right? We all have ideas. I want to be this. I want to be that. But then there's always this sense of, well, I need to go through schooling. I need to go through this experience, intern here, get this early job. And then eventually I will be able to start my own thing, right? That's typically how I think people who want to become entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, um, maybe you know, uh, course their path, if you will. So your journey with fashion started at 15 with you founding a company. I mean, what influenced you back then to say, you know what, now's the time? Well, I think there were a couple of big contributing factors. Um, one being that I'm sort of very lucky in that my parents and most of my family are entrepreneurs. So that's something I've always been exposed to. Um, and I've never really had any fears around it or I guess the same sense that it's a huge risk to take um, that maybe someone would have whose um, who's family are in more traditional work. Um, so there was that barrier that already I'd, I'd never had to experience. Um, and then the other piece is that when I was uh, 13, um, I left school for two years and sailed from the UK to New Zealand with my mum and stepdad. Um, oh. Basically had this huge lifestyle change um, and really during that time just got to create so I mean a lot of the time we were uh, we were in port but whilst we were at sea sometimes for stretches of four to five weeks at a time um, I'd be writing I'd be sketching um, I'd be figuring out kind of what I wanted to do when I arrived um, and had the you know the benefit of being in one physical location for a length of time um, and I was already really obsessed with fashion. So I, you know, started off kind of designing like, oh, this is, you know, when, when there are shops again, this is what I want to buy for myself. Um, and really by the time that I got to the other side in New Zealand, um, I had a pretty, I, I had solidified the idea that fashion was what I wanted to do. Um, and then in New Zealand itself, um, it was a much easier school curriculum than it had been in the UK, um, even having taken two years out. So I had uh, kind of extra time on my hands. Um, I 
uh, saw locally that there were sewing and pattern cutting classes available. So I just enrolled myself in those um, and really just decided to to go for it because I knew even at that time that design would be just a really small piece of the puzzle. Um, and I wanted to learn like how to build a supply chain, how to sell wholesale, how to market stuff, how to fill out a yeah. tax return. Um, and it seemed like it was a great opportunity to be able to do that before going and doing my formal fashion training. Because again, like I, from what I knew about fashion school, which was definitely accurate by the time I went there, is they don't teach you that much about the the business side of things. Um, so I just wanted to take the opportunity whilst I felt that I had it. So what was that first step for you, right? You had all these sketches, drawings, right? I want to be in this space to be an entrepreneur and start my own brand. Was it at that time, right? Um, so yeah. what was that first step that you took um, for, for those interested in just trying to start something new? Um, so I figured out what would be the, the lowest hanging fruit to test stuff out, which was um, customizing t-shirts. Um, so I ordered like a, in bulk these uh, blank t-shirts um, and basically started designing um, screen prints and patches, um, chopping up the t-shirts and so on, and just figuring out a, a collection that way. Um, and then literally just started walking into local stores with my t-shirts and having a chat. Um, and I think the novelty, especially, you know, the people are very nice in New Zealand and the novelty of having this like teenager wander in with her wares. Um, <laughs> a lot of people were very keen to support. Um, and that was really how I, how I got started. And I was lucky to have that um, initial encouragement um, because, yeah, definitely, um, I mean, even now, I would absolutely, um, the idea of just walking into a store and <laughs> trying to trying Buy to my pitch shirt. myself is horrifying. <laughs> so how I managed to do it at that time, I have no idea. That's incredible. Um, so I read somewhere that you spent a lot of your youth protesting. Um, um, yes. <laughs> or, or being active you know, kind of going behind movements and being very, very vocal about things. So, yeah, what, what called you to become an activist and, and kind of, you know, outspoken? Because, uh, again, it's not very, uh, very common for someone who's that young to go out and do that, right? Sure. I, I think really my mom. Um, so, I, you know, she would be engaging me in conversation about geopolitics for as long as I can remember. Um, She's a very curious person, um, very much a researcher. Uh, she would always be sort of digging, I guess, behind headlines, digging behind mainstream media. Um, and she just got me very interested in, um, in the world um, and, you know, what was happening outside of my own little bubble. Um, and then the other side of that um, has the, um, all of the kind of build up to the, um, Iraq war was happening. I was living very close to one of the uh, Navy bases. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of my friends in school had uh, parents who were in the British Navy. Um, so it was a really hot topic as well, just within my community. Um, and a lot of the protesting kind of took place around the, the Navy yards and stuff. So, you know, at 12, I was like, trying to climb over the gates of the Navy yards wearing my like hazmat suit and like I mean obviously managed to not get arrested but um yeah the the opportunity was was there I guess and I was very passionate about it I've been brought up to be very passionate around um around these issues like especially um especially around kind of war intervention and, and so on just um again just the conversations that I'd had with um with my mom I mean I'm 31 now so most of my um I guess formative years there were all of these oil wars that were going on one after the other um mm. and there was there was just so much that was was happening so that was like 9-11 and so on like all at times when I was at an age where that was really um really impactful um so and that and that um, I guess outspokenness and need to be able to 
express myself through some form of protest has very much bled into uh, my work um, and how I go about designing, storytelling and, and so on. We will definitely be exploring that because I think that gives um, you the distinctive visual identity uh, in a lot of the work that I see online. And I'm sure there's a whole bunch that is not um, yet listed on online, um, but it's it's different and it's different in such a good way. Um, and there's always a story, I think, behind every designer's, you know, either from one collection to another or just, I would say, um, the way that the designer kind of does their work across everything. Every piece has a story, right? So let's now go to post, um, post-fashion post school, right? At, at that age, you were, what, like 18, 19 years old? Uh, um, somewhere? Yes, I was, was 18, 19 when 18. I started. So, so 22 when I came out. 22. Four year. What did you care most about changing, you know, within the fashion industry at that time? I think, um, I think at that time it was really around sustainability, um, not just from the um, environmental side of production and the ethical side of production, um, but also from trying to figure out how the consumer could get as much wear and value from what they were buying. So I was really, I got really interested in um, tech wear and technical fabrics um, and how I could bring in these properties of like comfort and durability um, and like real practicality into something that was more contemporary and fashion led. Um, and I mean, that yeah, that's how I sort of got into um, active wear and tech wear pretty much um, straight away after I graduated um so it, it all kind of came came together around sustainability but also around uh how can I get somebody to really value this how can I design something that someone's going to want to wear every day when you talk about fusing physical and digital identity and kind of staying consistent I guess um as one of the main mm, main main goals or or I don't know actually I would like to ask you that. Does your identity have to be consistent, right? I think there are, I think there are two ways that um, people are approaching and will approach this. Either that you want to have this very clear, consistent identity. For example, a brand or someone who's built a personal brand or right. somebody who just wants to have a consistent identity. Um, and then you'll have this other type of person who really enjoys being able to create um, alter egos and alternative identities depending on you know where they're playing or where they're socializing mm -hmm. um, in the same way that you know in our physical lives as well um, you represent yourself probably in a different way in a professional context versus a social context versus when you're like with your family for the holidays and um, we do have all these different facets of ourselves that we explore visually in different ways. Um, so the metaverse is a really good way to do that as well. Um, so what I think is interesting is not just about the ability to have a consistent identity, but to have as much power and flexibility over how we curate our visual identity in the digital world as we do in the physical world. Mm -hmm. whether you want that to be one consistent identity or lots of different um, alter, alter egos. So are any of the big brands right now, or the luxury brands, let's maybe narrow it down to that, are any of them really working on um, kind of solving some of the issues that you mentioned and also touching some of these important um, aspects of fusing physical and digital identity, uh, you know, that that we're talking about right now? Is is anyone really on the cutting edge that you know of? I mean, sadly, the the person who really was was Virgil Abloh. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if you've sort of seen or read any of his um, manifestos around the around the metaverse and identity. Um, but he was somebody that really was doing a lot to be able to bring luxury fashion into the space and helping people understand um, the importance of it. 
Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, it's obviously a very, um, a very tragic loss. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of other luxury brands, I think you have, um, say like Balenciaga and Louis Vuitton, especially who have understood that their new consumer is a, is a gamer. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've been doing a lot of really interesting experimentation, uh, collaborating with the gaming industry and exploring digital identity, crossing over with physical garments in that way. Um, you have, I mean, sort of out of luxury, but still on the fashion side, you have um, Adidas who have made a really interesting play. Actually, I think they're one of the brands who've been most successful in integrating with the Web3 community. Um, they recently uh, did a, a drop with a like two very big NFT projects, Punks Comics and uh, Board Apes Yacht Club. Um, which is both digital and there'll be physicals that will be dropping. Um, But before they did that, they spent um, most of this year very actively engaging with the whole community. That's something the wider luxury industry haven't put enough effort into yet. Um, How to actually authentically engage with, um, with the community because that's actually a, you know, a massive, a massive piece of it. Um, and something that I think is very positive in that it gives um, new brands and new designers um, a, a, letting, a, a level playing field yeah. because they can, if they can build a community, then they can come into this with as much power as a, a luxury brand coming in um, because they, it's, you know, it comes down to how well you can engage with and speak to the community as well as, as well as talent. Well, how do you think Adidas did that, right? Because they're they're just as well known as the next, you know, Nike, Reebok you've worked with, right? Um, you know, they're they're not a new startup by any means. So how do you think they just came out and said, hey, look, Web3 community, like we want to also be in this space, like let's get some, you know, engagements going. How how do you think they did that successfully? I think they did a lot of research um, as to what would be the best way to go about it. And they they really took their time getting to know the community before they tried to monetize it. Uh, whereas most brands are coming in straight away, um, mm. trying to monetize without putting in those, those months first. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because even within the sports wear industry where I know you get some of your influence from, right? The active wear and the tech wear. Um, there's this question of, you know, is the stuff within this industry commoditized um, where there's not really the sense of exclusivity as it is like when I think of Adidas, I don't think, oh, wow, you know, lots of brand collaborations, lots of lots of exclusive drops in the same way that I would associate a luxury brand, small or big, in the way that they go out and try to curate their so-called community of buyers, right? Um, sure. and, and so it's interesting, I think, with these um, these brands like Adidas and and Nike coming into the space and really wanting to integrate, you know, in the metaverse and in Web3, trying to build some exclusivity by way of nfts um and and maybe you know they become i i I use this word a lot but they become the luxury so-called brands of the digital world sure but you know not because of material necessarily but through the different engagements that they end up creating or collaborations right what do you think about that sure i think um i think first of all exclusivity and luxury within the metaverse is going to come more from access. Um, so what access do these tokens grant you, whether they're wearables or JPEGs or whatever else? Um, and you have, um, I think, the, the sportswear and the streetwear industry that are much more culturally connected. They're working, for example, all the time within the music industry. So maybe that's part of the access that they're able to grant that Mm -hmm. is just, you know, it's not generally within the remit of a a luxury brand because that's not, that's not how they go about their partnerships. 
um, it's I think it's more more natural to be looking at ways to create this um, these events and this access because that's what sportswear streetwear brands are used to doing that's the the way that they've grown in the first place mm-hmm. so it's much more it's much more natural um, I think where the where the luxury industry will come in initially probably a bit like the Dolce and Gabbana drop is where they're granting um, I believe with that there was a utility where the um the holders get access to the couture shows um like access is going to be the probably the smart way for the the luxury industry to get involved and it's going to be much more around that than about garments that are being worn in the metaverse Mm. um but i think where there's the most scope to build the like the the web3 native luxury brands are the the native brands that are coming in now um, it's kind of an open, um, an open playing field. Um, and I mean, if we look at what's considered luxury within, uh, profile pictures, which is, uh, where, you know, so much of the money within NFTs mm-hmm. is being spent now, provenance is hugely important. Um, and I think that's going to play out within, uh, within fashion as well, the the brands that start early and have that uh, provenance of being an OG um, within digital fashion, um, that's going to have uh, a lot of value attached to it um, over the next few years. Yeah, I think the big question is, what does luxury mean in Web3, right? How does that change from the traditional sense of the word? So I, so I think that's like a really big question for our listeners to also maybe just yeah think about right because it doesn't necessarily mean what's what's existed in the physical world is necessarily just going to pour over 100 percent into the digital world and as you say access right um maybe that is the defining definition of luxury and it's not that that concept doesn't exist in luxury because obviously that's what exclusivity means right but it's a bit more democratized, I would say. Yeah. Not entirely. <laughs> Not um, entirely. But I think we are progressively getting there. Um, so I think what's what would be interesting now is to explore how the Charlie Cohen brand is doing that, right? Like, w- what is your strategy when it comes to building garment, digital fashion, you know, for the metaverse? So, I mean, this is probably where my, my second company comes in, um, which I've been building through the last year um, and launching um, early 2021, Restless. Um, and the, the, per- or the way that Restless came about was me within Charlie Cohen trying to figure out how to be able to streamline the collaborations that we've been doing because we had all of these different stakeholders. Uh, so there's the, the license that we're working with for the collaboration, um, then the different, uh, the different tech partners, the different artists, the different game environments that we're creating digitals for, the physical supply chain. Um, and it was a very, each collaboration has been a very convoluted process having to go to each of these stakeholders, then it goes back through us, back to the license, back to us. Um, so I was trying to figure out how to streamline this within Charlie Cohen. Um, and that really evolved into, into Restless. Um, and the, the premise of Restless is that you can come in as a, a fan of a certain uh, brand or IP or artist. You can choose a, um, a fashion silhouette, um, you know, street, streetwear, techwear silhouette. Um, you can then customize it with the graphics IP of, uh, of whoever the um, the brand that we're collaborating with or, or mm-hmm. dropping, uh, whether that's a, a Web3 native artist or a mu- musician, um, there'll be a mix of Web3 and traditional IP. Um, so they can customize their garment with these graphics, then they can mint it, and then they can put together a bundle of different renders of that garment for each of the environments that they game in or that they socialize in. And they can also redeem a physical version. So it's kind of about creating this hub that connects all of these very disparate um, economies and ecosystems that make up the metaverse, um, including traditional gaming industry as well. 
Um, but being able to design and create something very easily in one place um, and then be able to connect all of the different versions that you need to that. Has there been any thought around uh, working with esports? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a very, very natural, a very natural crossover. So yeah, we have been been talking quite a lot to um, the uh, to the esports industry, um, and there are, I mean, there are lots of ways to approach that. First of all, it's a very natural audience. Um, mm-hmm. I think the importance of having um, physical as well as digital is there too, um, because you have these physical events um, and these communities that are having these um, IRL touch points all the time through the year. Um, But obviously most of their socializing is taking place in the digital world. You have the esports teams who are celebrities in their own right um, amongst their, amongst their fan bases, Um, the streamers who are celebrities in their own right. Um, So being able to, provide um well first of all a way for the actual uh teams and streamers to perhaps create their own um their own merchandise Mm -hmm. for their fan base um that's something that's really important um being able to create uh an experience that maybe only uh participants of a physical event or people who are coming into the digital stream can access um so i guess taking what we built uh, for Pokemon, uh, this virtual city as an example, Um, we could work with an esports team to create an experience where just people who are at the particular event access this virtual space via a a QR code, um, and then they can purchase something that's exclusive to this, um, you know, this this, uh, final or like day, day event. Um, so there are, I think there are definitely lots of different ways. It's the, it's really the OG physical digital crossover, mm-hmm. um, esports. Uh, so yeah, very, very natural partner. Well, let's talk about Reebok as well. That she looked really cool. I don't know if I can get one oh, thank now. Thank you. <laughs> um, but the concept there, this is something I picked up in, I guess it was your interview that you did uh when it was, was kind of like showcasing a few models uh for the shoe the the concept was destruction is a requirement for evolution talk a bit about that that's super cool yeah i think it's this um i guess like solve and coagula within alchemy um you have to sometimes really destroy something to be able to build something new um one brand who i think doing brilliantly at coming from the physical space into the metaverse are the hundreds um and they the hundreds. oh right is it the atom bomber yeah uh, okay yeah atom atom bomb squad um and when they dropped um they were putting a lot of effort afterwards into writing all of the stories around the different artwork so when the reveal of the artwork happened um there was all of this um history and context to it um, so it ended up taking taking weeks after people had uh, minted their Adam Bomb Squad for the actual image to reveal in the wallets. Um, so yeah, people were just uh, ask. It just became kind of a running joke that people were asking when metadata <laughs> over the course of the week. Um, so I um, so this is in the hundreds logo font. I made one of these T-shirts for uh, Bobby Hundreds, um, and then just made one for myself. Amazing. Um, but yeah, that was, but, but they're doing again, like they really understand about uh, grassroots community building um, mm-hmm. and they've done a really amazing job. So I think they're probably the best example of a, you know, a very established physical brand coming into this space and, and doing a really good job. I, I remember missing that NFT drop. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, it's only been a few minutes. How how does this possible? <laughs> it's I mean, there are still um there are still bargains to be had on OpenSea. So definitely definitely get on there. Check, it out. <laughs> <laughs> check out check out Adam Bomb Squad. I've got quite a healthy collection of them myself. Um so back to back to you, uh your question around Reebok um and the like destruction being this precursor to evolution. Um 
so as I was saying before, I had a coughing fit. <laughs> that um, it's really this uh, concept of um, of alchemy, solving and coagula. Um, you need to be able to. Well, sometimes you need to completely destroy something to be able to build it up. It's not enough to be, um, I guess, like plastering over the cracks. Um, it's actually a whole new system that needs to be built. Um, so that's really what I was speaking to. It, it's being able to take the take the risk of you know huge transformation uh, to be able to get to where things should be or where you want things to be. Yeah, I mean, for for something like this collection, um, is it? a repeatable theme for you as a brand? Like, would you go on and do this exact same thing with an Adidas or, a, you know, Nike? Um, or is it just one off and you kind of want to keep it that way? I think it's it's probably one of the themes that comes up for me. Um, I would like with every collection that I design, collaboration that I do, I want to be able to approach stories in different ways. Um, but there are definitely these running themes um so you know evolution and metamorphosis is a really ongoing theme for me um the conflict between digital and physical identity is something that's been a really ongoing theme for me um and the sort of <clears throat> matrix-esque themes around you know is it simulation or reality that's a very ongoing theme for me as well um and we talk about mental health a lot through our different collaborations also. Um, so, yeah, these are these are themes, I guess, we explore just in different ways. Mm -hmm. Well, you even have a podcast as well on the Charlie Cohen website. You even have a podcast, Shades of Blue. <laughs> yeah, and you've got several conversations going already at this time. When did that project start? So even since the very beginning of uh, launching the Charlie Cohen brand, I'd always been very outspoken around my own mental health um, and my personal struggles. Um, and it was something that I realized whenever I put something out there, um, I was getting so much back from the community, just, you know, that they were feeling heard, that they weren't feeling so alone. Um, and, you know, I realized actually, I can really help people if I use this as a platform to just you know bring up these issues that we're we're all dealing with um but not necessarily talking about and the concept for shades of blue uh, i really wanted to formalize something around it kind of under the charlie cohen umbrella mm -hmm. um and i thought that it was important to talk about mental health specifically within the creative industries where you have um you have artists and creators who are in many cases creating because that's their outlet for dealing with mental health um it you know artistic people tend to be very emotional and very deep and often they're artists because that's how they're dealing with some kind of trauma so you have probably a disproportionate number of people who are suffering um, and then the creative industries are some of the worst for exploitation um, and I guess just really facilitating um, poor mental health, um, substance abuse, overworking, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the glorification mm -hmm. of suffering, uh, the whole kind of struggling artist, uh, tortured artist stereotype that's quite glamorized. Um, so I just wanted to look at um, I wanted to speak to people from different parts of the creative industry, understand their experience um, personally, and then also what's right and wrong uh, within their industry as it relates to, to mental health and supporting people. Mm. Well, what's been one of the most surprising things since, you know, starting the podcast and going through all those conversations for you, you know, speaking with people in the industry? Most surprising things? Um. I think um, I think probably how how open people are willing to be once mm. they you know once they realize that first of all it's therapeutic for them 
uh, but also it's therapeutic for other people to hear them, how far people are willing to go um, to really just lay out all of their history and their trauma in public. Um, it's uh, when it's still, I mean, we're in a much better position now, but it's still quite stigmatizing, especially um, especially with men. Mm. Um so yeah, I think I think just the the openness has been a great surprise, but still a surprise. And you're the one who is carrying these conversations a lot of the times, right? It's not like you've sure. just, you know, pawned it off to some podcast studio and say, "Hey, I, I want to do this. This is a concept, and go and help me, you know, create the narratives." Right? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, these are honestly conversations that I have with people all the time. Um, I mean anyone that's met me in real life um and we've had i guess a more meaningful conversation than small talk mm-hmm. they will probably tell you that um we've you know we've we've gone through we've uh, unpicked their you know their trauma their current relationships there's always there's always a reason it seems uh, like the time that i meet people is to have these conversations um and people will tell me things that they haven't expressed before or even really dug into themselves before um so i think it's just one of my one of my roles is to have these conversations with people Mm. you know and i think this actually you know connects quite nicely with the larger narrative about what it means to be a brand in web3 what does accessibility mean what does it mean to connect with your community um you know taking you as a brand right you seem accessible as a person i don't know who the ceo of all these other big brands in the physical worlds are. And if I ever were to meet one of them, it's because I probably won a lottery ticket uh, to go to a show. And that somehow granted me a 10 minute access to talk about, you know, who knows what, right? But not in the same way that I think these homegrown kind of grassroots brands trying to, you know, make it in the Web3 space are interacting from the top down, right? You as a fashion designer, as a founder of the company, all the way down to, you know, people who you work with, right? Um, those down the line in the supply chain, like, I'm sure it's not, you, you don't think of that whole operation as very piecemeal. And I don't deal with these guys. I, I only want to deal with them as like the head honcho, right? I, I'm, I'm sure that the the idea of running the brand and the operations is also quite different when it comes to building for Web3. Yeah, it's very, it's very holistic. Um, I think Web3 teams as well, it's, it's just, it's much less hierarchical, much more collaborative. Mm. Um, the, I guess it's more like a startup where the, the core team are usually stakeholders in the company as well. Like they have a real ownership of what they're building um and yeah it's it's not about there being a boss it's just about having your set responsibilities um a level of structure that keeps everything moving along how it should Mm -hmm. but everyone really having um ownership over the the process and the final outputs which is the way that you know i've always uh been as a ceo anyway that's how i like to uh i like to build a team be able to give everyone a lot of flexibility, a lot of ownership. Um, and that's, it's the way that things are just naturally building out in in Web3. I think especially in Web3, um, the number of teams uh, who've never met each other, um, it's, it's, it's about mm. people kind of who come together over an right. idea and an ethos. Um, and then, you know, they're just working together to be able to build something um, that they feel is needed in the space. Um, it's a much more organic process, I guess. Um, they're like, right, I'm going to start this company. I'm now going to hire a team. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's much more organic. So talk about how the whole collaboration with, you know, Poke- Pokemon, the, the IP, and Selfridges came about. So we got the license to do something with Pokemon um, at the end of last year. We knew we wanted to do something that was a real crossover between digital and physical. We knew we wanted to do something to celebrate the 25th anniversary, um, but we hadn't fully decided what it would be yet. 
Um, and shortly after that, um, Selfridges got in touch with us because they really wanted to do some kind of um, activation around the metaverse. Um, and they were really keen to be a first mover um, as a department mm-hmm. store. So it just seemed like a really, um, a really great way to uh, bring these two opportunities together. Um, and we worked together with um, Riot, uh, Yahoo Lab. So they are a uh, fantastic team that specialize in uh, immersive tech and um, like digital retail experiences. We'd worked with them, um, the, we worked with them last year, creating this uh, virtual reality experience. Um, and they sort of partnered with us um, and helped us build out this um, like insane game world. Um, it's st- it's still up, so I would highly encourage anyone to visit electriccity.co um, and just have an explore because the, it really is um, it really is very beautifully put together. Um, and so yeah, we had this sort of dream team of of partners to to make this happen. Um, and yeah, I think it's one of my proudest projects to date. Mm-hmm. Do you have any other brands that you wish to work with? Not necessarily planned, but just over the long term, you know, you you respect and want to collaborate with. Oh, I think I think many. Um, I think even like I love I love working with. Um, with music artists and music industry. Um, if I hadn't gone into fashion, I would have gone into music. So that's my way of just being able Keep to it, yeah. to tap into that. And I think as well, there's just so much around creating these full sensory experiences that, that make sense within music. Um, so, you know, partnering with more record labels, partnering with more independent artists. Um, but also I would love to be working more with... Um, with web three native artists too. Um, so it's, I guess my, over the last couple of years, um, I've almost shifted to wanting to work more with the, um, with these more like anarchistic web three artists <laughs> who are, you know, coming in and autonomous yeah. um, versus the, the more traditional IPs. Um, but yeah, I think without, I think I'm going to jinx it if I name names, because Sorry. there are a lot of, there are a lot of the people who I really want to work with, who I probably will be working with now. Um, but yeah, let's, let's, let's leave it as, um, the well, like, we'll progressive keep it as music a industry, <laughs> progress, progressive music industry, um, and yeah, artists who are, who are killing it in the NFT space. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, as we wrap up here, Charlie, I just wanted to end with, you know, two, again, more big picture questions. And the first one is, why is the metaverse important to you? You could be doing so many different things, right? Um, working on other aspects of Web3, continuing that Charlie Cohen brand just physically, you know, in the physical space. Why the metaverse right now? I think the the metaverse right now is most closely tied to like who we are and how we express ourselves um, and how we, um, I guess, how we're able to um, reconcile um, who we are in the physical world versus who we are in, in the digital world. Um, I, I think it's just, it's, it's so fundamental to everything, being able to, being able to, I guess, comfortably be you. Um, I think as well being able to comfortably express yourself is something that web to social media has damaged severely over the years especially for the younger generation coming in who are so scared of doing anything that might get them criticized or cancelled or trolled um the metaverse gives these generations a way to um explore identity in the same way that we were able to before uh, before social media, um, but with even more tools to go even more experimental. Um, and if you want to be anonymous, pseudonymous, you can be. Um, and yeah, you, you can just really um, experiment and explore, which is um, just you know hugely important to self-development, to mental health, uh, to understanding who you want to be and what you want to do. It's just, like, as I said, like, it's really, really fundamental. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you've, you've mentioned, right, 31, we're both, you know, kind of on the border, I think, of 
being millennials. Uh, <laughs> and what we're seeing right now in Web3 is, you know, the, the the rise of, you know, Gen Zers who are really wanting to start off their career in Web3, right? They're not saying let's yeah. go traditional and then move over. And so I've always been wondering about this generational divide uh, when it comes to understanding what the metaverse is about first and foremost, and how meaningful virtual life can be, right? Um, my parents don't understand why we even need anything digital in terms of uh, garments. W what does that do for you? If I can't wear it, what's the purpose, right? Um, sure. So it's, it's not to say, you know, their view um, should be discounted just because we've moved so far ahead in terms of innovation, but rather taking it into context and saying, well, hold on a minute. That means the what we value is changing and how we're valuing, you know, these assets, right? Pieces of work. Um, that's also changing as well. So can you talk a bit about maybe that generational divide from, from your perspective, um, you know, what it means to one create virtual life and why that should be important to the future generations that are going to be working uh, in the metaverse and digital fashion space. Sure. I think, I mean, you know, one of the things that the metaverse is built on, we've learned through web two social media, the actual depth of connection and relationship you can make with people online who you've never met or never seen um, and how real that is uh, I think that's where you know that's the place where you kind of need to bridge the understanding and the pandemic has done something for that where suddenly we've all gone remote we've had to find mm -hmm. these virtual ways to communicate with each other some feel more like we're in the room with each other than others um, the technology that is making up and evolving the metaverse um, makes those interactions um, as real as possible. I think um, it was a real eye opener for me last year when I'd, um, I'd been in LA for nearly six months away from my team in London um, and we were doing this virtual reality project. And as a team, uh, we were setting up the space and just hanging out as avatars in the space. Um, not even realistic avatars, literally just floating <laughs> shapes. Um, and it felt so much like we would, because we were talking to each other um, and we could see something of each other kind of moving around and could, uh, you know, virtually interact with each other. Um, it felt so, so real. Um, it felt like so similar to being physically in, in a room. Um, and I, I think with this, um, the generation who don't understand um, the the gateway drug is maybe giving them access to that type of experience uh, so they can start to understand the depth of connection that's possible in the metaverse. And then through that, it becomes clearer why um, why identity in the metaverse is important, why the economy of the metaverse is important, why uh, you know these new generations building businesses in the metaverse is important? Why it's uh, why it's kind of the next the next step for us as a society? So many truth bombs, so many just interesting insights shared during this conversation, Charlie. It's always so great to chat with you, a thought leader in the new digital fashion space, um, and of course, you know, as one of the first conversations that I'm having, uh, you know, about the metaverse and, you know, this mini series that we're doing uh, with Real Vision. So appreciate you so much for coming on the show. And I know our audience is really going to enjoy this. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. It's been really great chatting to you.